Hello, students. So it turns out there is a reason why we talked about elasticity before talking about taxes. These topics are not in random order. It turns out that elasticity determines which side pays most of the burden of the tax. In our earlier examples, it looked like producers paid most of the tax. That's not always true. Taxes are also not going to be divided equal necessarily either. What will be important is looking at the relative elasticities of supply and demand. So just some quick review. What do we mean by elasticity? So I have two graphs here, graph A and graph B. Which one of them would represent an elastic demand curve? Go ahead and pause the video and think about that. When you think you have the answer, press play and we'll see if you're right. All right, I'll assume you've given us some thought. So elastic means it's very responsive to price. So a small change in price gives you a big change in quantity if demand is elastic. That sounds a lot like graph A. Small change in P, big change in Q. So graph A is elastic. We say demand is inelastic if it's not very responsive to price. So a big change in price gives you a small change in Q. So graph B is inelastic. So here is elastic demand. There is inelastic demand. Supply is very similar. So this first graph here shows you an elastic supply curve. Small change in P gives you big change in Q, so supply is very sensitive to price. Our second graph shows you inelastic supply. Big change in P results in only a modest change in Q, so this supply curve does not respond very much to price. It does respond, just not very dramatically. So let's say we have very elastic supply. So supply is, it's not totally flat, but it's pretty close to flat. So small change in price would give you a big response in quantity supply. Let's also have a relatively inelastic demand curve. So this demand curve is very steep, and we see that if you change price by a lot, quantity barely budges. Now let's add a tax to our story. Now I just said a tax doesn't matter. We said if it's a tax on supply or a tax on demand. We showed in the previous episode that they are equivalent. So I add a tax to this graph over here. Who is going to bear most of the burden? Will it be consumers or will it be producers? So go ahead and pause the video and think about that for a while. When you think you have the answer, press play and we'll see if you're right. Okay, let's see the answer. So I made a graph really big so you can see things more clearly. So I should tax on demand. Once again, however, a tax on supply would be exactly the same, so it doesn't matter. If we tax demand, demand is going to shift from D0, the original demand, to D1, new demand. P star is the market price. That'd be the price we get when there is no taxation. That's where our original demand curve meets supply. So by tax demand, what does that do to producers? Well, demand is going to fall and that's going to push prices down. The new price will be where the new demand curve, D1, meets our supply curve. That happens right over there. 
So price will go down from P star up here to this price will be just a little bit lower. So prices go down by a tiny amount. So that gives you a tiny reduction in the welfare for the producers. Of course, producers don't like it when prices go down. That's why their welfare is going down. So it gives you this tiny little black rectangle here. And that's the loss. That's the amount of tax that producers are paying in the form of lower prices. Because supply was almost flat, that means that when demand fell like this, prices went down by only a little amount, which caused only a little amount of harm to the producers. Now consumers pay this big green rectangle over here. So consumers benefit from lower prices, but prices again barely went down at all. So it's a very tiny benefit to consumers. So as a result, they're paying almost the entire amount of the tax. The tax is the gap between old and new demand, this big height over here. So they're bearing that burden. They get only a tiny price reduction. So they're stuck with the rest of that bill. So they're paying this price up here effectively instead of paying P star. So they're paying this much per unit. You can see quite visually that they're paying way more than the producers are. So what we're seeing is that when supply is elastic and when demand is inelastic, consumers pay more. Now in this graph, the deadweight loss is the red triangle. I'll just remind you of where that comes from again. So these trades here in that region would have benefited both sides. Consumers are willing to pay the amount given by a demand curve D0, they're willing to pay this much. Sellers would have accepted the amount given by their supply curve this little. So if I'm willing to accept the price of $4 and you're willing to pay me $9, that sounds like good news to both of us. If there's a big tax in the way though, the tax is say $10, then you're not willing to pay anymore. I'm not willing to sell anymore. And those trades that would help both of us no longer happen. That's an extra loss to society that's over and above the revenue that's collected the deadweight loss. All right, so once again, if supply is elastic and demand is not, then a tax is mostly borne by consumers. Let's talk about the opposite scenario. Let's say that demand is elastic. You see this mostly flat demand curve that if you change prices by a little bit, like from here to there, you get a big change in Q. So Q is very sensitive to price. So here the demand is elastic. Supply, however, is inelastic. So I change price by a lot, then Q barely responds. So supply is inelastic. So supply is inelastic and demand is elastic. Now who's going to bear the majority of the burden. Go ahead and pause the video. While you think about that, when you think you've solved it, press play. So let's go over the answer. I'll look at a tax on demand once again. Though, if we tax supply instead, it would all be the same. Tax on demand is equivalent to tax on supply. We learned that earlier. So if you tax demand, the demand is going to shift back by the amount of the tax. Prices were originally up here where old demand meets supply. Once demand shifts back, prices have to fall and now they're going to fall all the way down over here. So what does that do? Producers 
though they don't legally pay any pilot tax, are actually hurt quite a bit by this. Prices fell all the way from P star to this way lower level over here. So producers get a lot less money than they used to every time they sell a good, even though they're legally not paying any part of the tax. So if the price used to be $8, but now they're only getting $4, they're effectively paying $4 in taxes. So they're paying this much effectively per unit. They're going to sell this many units. How many sales given by where is new demand? D1 meets supply. So they're selling this many units. So they sell this many units and they pay effectively this much per unit. You get this black rectangle of how much the producers are effectively paying. Now let's talk about the consumer side. Consumers pay the tax, but they benefit from lower prices. Prices that we established fall a lot. And that's not going to almost entirely offset, though not completely, almost entirely offset the tax. So what the consumers effectively pay is going to be up here, which is only a little bit higher than what they're paying before. So what they're paying effectively is this green rectangle over here, which is pretty small. He can tell right away that producers pay a much bigger part of that tax than consumers do. You still get the same red deadweight loss triangle. That's the same story as before. The moral of this story, though, is that when demand is elastic and supply is inelastic, then suppliers bear most of the burden. So let's put those two examples together. When demand was more elastic, then producers paid most of the tax. When supply was more elastic, then consumers were the ones paying most of the tax. So the society is stuck with most of the bill, the bigger part of the burden, that's always going to be the less elastic side. So when supply was less elastic, when demand was more elastic, that means supply was less elastic. When supply was less elastic, suppliers paid most of the tax. If supply is more elastic and demand is less elastic than demand, consumers pay most of the tax. It's always the less elastic side paying most of the tax. So why is that true? Well, think about it this way. Taxes change prices. So you tax demand, then price falls because demand falls. If you tax supply like we had back over um, we had back over here, that's going to raise prices. So taxes change prices. So taxes lead to price changes. Now a side that's less elastic is the one that's going to be less sensitive, less responsive to prices. So they're more willing to tolerate a change in prices. That means you can push most of the burden on them in the form of price changes and they're going to just put up with it. So less, the less elastic side will bear most of the burden in the form of price changes. So when demand was less elastic, that means that consumers don't care very much about price. They keep buying about the same amount, whether prices go up or go down. That means you put a tax on this market, put a tax on, let's say, producers, they can raise the price and get away with it because consumers keep buying about the same amount that they did before. They're not very responsive to prices. So demand is less elastic than consumers bear most of the burden because prices go up by a lot. 
If supply were less elastic, it's going to be just the reverse. That means that producers keep producing about the same amount, regardless of how high or low prices are. If you were to tax demand then, consumers will be getting much lower prices in because suppliers keep doing about the same thing no matter what. So in that case, when supply is less elastic, then suppliers get most of the burden of the tax in the form of lower prices. So that's how elasticity determines who is really paying the tax.